thank you for being here. Uh, I'm super nervous. The first thing that I always have to say is that this research is mine, is my thesis, uh, that has nothing to do with my employee, and the things that I did here, uh, I did outside of the work time. So that's me. Uh, I'm a malware researcher at F-Secure. I also help organ organizing the Black Hoodie, that's a um, reverse engineering bootcamp just for women. Uh, I am a really proud program in the pro program committee member of HackLoo, and our call for papers is open, so submit. Uh, I'm also ambassador for Disobey, that's a kind of a hacker conference in Finland. And today I'll be talking about um, yeah, malware analysis and logical programming. So I will try to explain really shortly and without the math what uh, constrained logical programming is. Uh, for that I will talk about SMT servers and how we can use them in a malware analysis. Um, then I will talk about the applications of the constrained logical programming in the IT security. Uh, I will talk about binary obfuscation and how you can use the SMT servers to deobfuscate malware. Uh, so first of all, SMT servers um, can be viewed like a huge server for equations. So if you have a system of a lot of equations, you can use the SMT servers to solve these equations for you. Uh, the main difference between SMT servers and the set servers that most of the people know about is that in the set servers you can just use um, Boolean equations to uh, resolve between two values like true and false. Uh, and with SMT servers you, you can resolve uh, with normal equations, also mathematical stuff. And so on. Um, and the good part of it is that a lot of real world problems can be represented as problem of solving system of equations. Um, I hear a lot of people saying that um, SMT solvers and symbolic execution is like a hype now. A lot of people are doing it and stuff. And before, no one was really talking about a real world applications of it. And I just don't believe that it's a hype because it's a really old theory. And yeah, I guess we just don't have, we didn't have the computer power for doing symbolic execution before, so it was more a hardware problem or a, a technology problem than um, the problem of the uh, theory. So what are constraints? We have like two main programming paradigms that we use, like or styles of building programs. Um, you have the imperative programming, that's a kind of, uh, that you just state the computer, what you, what you want the computer to do. And then you have um, another way that it's like describing to the, to the uh, computer what you have right now and what you want to get from it. So you are just describing what the program must, uh, must accomplish in terms of the problem that you have right now, rather than to say to computer like to the computer, yeah, do it this way and find out what you are going to do next. So you are not like a mom saying to the computer, hey, do go there and, and do this stuff and then come back. You are just saying, I have this problem, solve it for me. So if you think about um, a Freuder, that is a guy that I. I really, really appreciate the ideas that he has on computers. Uh, he noticed it like a way ago. He said like constraint programming is like the holy grail in the computer science. Uh, because you, using it, you have the computers there to do the stuff that you really want the computer to do, to solve the problems for you, right? So with the constraint programming, we state constraints about the problems that we have. and the computer will find the solutions for these constraints for you. Uh, of course, 
uh, that there is a theoretical limitation that's like um, I will talk about that after because now it's a bit complicated to understand but um, circa 90% of the, the real world problems that we have in the IT security for example or even in the math or, or stuff like that uh, they are they are problems that you can define and in this kind of models and they can be written like combinatorial problems so you can use uh, SMT solvers for solving it and constraints solving for infinite or more complex domains uh, are also possible but we still don't have the computers for it so don't worry, I told you I'm not putting the equations here and I'm not talking about the math of it. Uh, but to explain how SMT solvers work, we need to talk about predicate logic or logical programming. And for that you can see this SMT solver like a black box. So you have this formula that's the theory or the problem that you have, or the goals that you want to achieve. Then you put this stuff inside the SMT solver. It will reason about these logical connections between your problem and your goal. And then you say for you, like, is it feasible or is it not feasible to achieve the goals with the domains, the constraints that you have in your domain? Uh, and the best part of it is, like, it just, it, it's not just saying to you, like, yeah, it's feasible, you, it's possible to, to do that. It's also giving you instances. Uh, of the uh, ways of solving the problem. That means you also have all the possibilities of uh, the solution for the same problem. Um, so to understand why you have stuff like that, like SMT solvers, you need to think about um, who wants to prove a lot of things. Uh, we had in the keynote someone talking about LangSec, and they are also coming from the mathematicians, the SMG solvers were used before uh, to prove large theorems. So you can break the really biggest problems of the math in small little problems and you reason about all of them. And if you can prove all the small theorems, you can also prove the bigger one. So the same idea you can apply for hardware or software verification, for example. And then you can also um, think about um, proving that your software is secure or that the language that you are using is also secure. And symbolic execution is the most known way of using SMT servers today. Um, the symbolic execution of a program is nothing more than um, a path generator that it's constructing um, all the structure of the program and expanding all the paths of the control flow of, the, of your uh, system. Uh, and with that, you have like this 100% uh, code coverage that you have in the code verification. And the same thing you can do with binaries. Um, that means that it's possible to, to know that if you are in the time, like if you count like every path or every line of code, you can know exactly in every line of code which kind of input and output makes it possible to be in this point of the branching or something in the entry point until the end point of your program. So it looks like that. Um, you have your one input. And if you see the second line of code, you can see that your domains are going to, to be changing every single, in every single node. And if you do it for a small code, like here you have 11 lines of code, not even that, uh, you see already how many paths are possible. And that, that's one of the biggest problems with the symbolic execution. It's known as explosion, uh, path explosion that I'm also going to talk about after. Uh, 
The problem is that the precision of this graph that we are generating and the performance of the analysis of the code, they depend really strong on the options that we use to generate this kind of uh, control flow. Uh, that means that the context sensitivity of my graph that I'm generating uh, is, I guess, one of the most import, uh, important points uh, to think about when you consider if you are doing like malware detection or malware analysis. Uh, the configuration of these parameters that will determine uh, the representation of this kind of system calls, for example, or the branching points. And if you have uh, the possibility of having a high context sensitivity, you can also enable cross references between different systems calls that are invoked in multiple locations of the code, or even thinking about global variables. Um, the context sensitivity may also depend on the functions or the calls themselves. And furthermore, that means that increasing the context sensitivity results in a greater number of syscalls, uh, clones that you have in your, in your program. So you have a lot of nodes in your graph. And you can imagine how it looks like in, in a memory. So it's important to keep in mind when you are working with symbolic execution that you don't have uh, concrete values. You have like symbols as arguments. You are going to explore any feasible path in your code. And you have a program state. Um, you, you also need a lot of memory because the symbolic values are stored in a memory, and you have uh, and you have like a, also a problem with the time that it takes time to um, resolve about all these kind of domains that you have. So about the applications, uh, for the IT security, like here, uh, you can define a model that's pretty simple to understand. You can just say, my software is secure because nothing bad ever happens. Uh, that means that if I'm checking that my program is safe, I need to negate it because it's a predicate logic. So I will negate and say, OK, if something bad happens, that means that my software or my hardware is not secure. And that would be this formula that I am putting inside my SMT server. And I will ask, is it feasible? Is it possible that something bad happens that makes my software or my hardware not secure. So that's the most uh, known idea of using symbolic execution is for fuzzing or code verification or for binary analysis, but mostly for assuring or just kind of proving uh, that your software or your hardware is really secure. Um, then you have like as a kind of natural thing that it's coming with the exploitation. So you can, also, you can, of course, just take the inputs that you have that it are causing your program to not be secure as a proof of concept. But you also can think about uh, create some kind of automated exploit generation and also automate payload generation so, so that you don't need, you can use just the output of your SMT server, the, all the instances that you have and create a payload for it. And that's the part that I most like. It's to use this kind of symbolic execution to analyze malware. The problem with malware analysis is that um, malware is mostly obfuscated. They use all the compiler optimizations that they're having. And you also have like a trend with ransomware. So how binary obfuscation works, uh, it's a funny thing that, uh, that that's one of the things that's made me fall in love with the malware, because it's kind of dual, if you think about. Because malware is, if you think about the technical part and the educational part of it, it's really interesting. Uh, and some te techniques that you will see in the malware are not really different than the things that you use, for example, in software protection systems. So you have this game that you really want to play, but you don't want to pay. It's obfuscated. And then you have this malware that don't want to be found. 
uh, it's obfuscated, and they use the same tools and the same techniques. So in both cases, the, there is a program that's doing something. Uh, somebody puts kind of a cover or stuff around it that makes the program uh, really difficult to analyze and to understand how, how it works. And the problem is what is inside, but that is something that you can just know when you are inside. Um, so in one case, the objective would be uh, to make the analysis of the program so hard that, that you cannot write a cracker for it. And in, in the other way, uh, it would be just to make my heart really hard at work. So it's really dual, but really nice. Uh, so which kind of malware obfuscation I'm looking at right now? Well, when you are analyzing malware, you really think on the beginning, at least for me, that I, I'm new in the industry. I was like, yeah, what can be so hard? It's just assembly, right? Uh, <laughs> And then I got there, uh, I, I was sitting in front of, of my first binary at all, and I couldn't even understand what, what is this about. I, I never saw it before. No one is using this assembly code. I use it to write coding assembly, and I never use this kind of instructions. And yeah, compiler do. And the same thing uh, uh, works with packing. Uh, if you are a normal person, you're just like, zipping everything, or maybe doing tar uh, with easy, but they can write their own packers, but it's really nice sometimes. Um, and you have a lot of different values of obfuscations, like shoring and stuff like that. So shoring is also something that I see a lot, because in the world of malware, they don't want you to see the strings, and that's a really fast technique to just um, yeah, hide the URLs or the registry keys or whatever they don't want to see. Uh, another easy way to obfuscate malware is just put a lot of garbage code around it. So you write a lot of stuff like wires, wire true and it's ever, always false, or you put some if true and then it's always false, and stuff like that. So using SMG servers, it's also possible to simplify the code, just writing the constraint and saying, if it, this branch is never taken, uh, we don't need to analyze it. You can just delete it from your control program, and then you have less code to analyze. Uh, well, with the packers, uh, sometimes malware, they, they, developers, they go a bit further when they want to make your life hard, and they write their own packer. And most of them are really easy. You just put the breakpoint and read it, your memory dump, and that's done. But sometimes they are not so easy. Sometimes you have the packer inside the packer, and then you need to unpack the packer. And you know what I mean. <laughs> and with the SMG server, it's also possible to, re to just resolve all this kind of stuff. And in the end, you, you get really the last memory dump. You don't need to think about how many times you need to unpack something. Uh, so the limitations, uh, there is a really good one. If you think about uh, the theory of it, um, I guess everybody knows what a Turing machine is. And that just means it's it's impossible to write a software that will prove that your software is safe because a software cannot read a software until the end. Um, and that is the practical thing. The practical thing is you need someone behind the code when you start because um, the SMT servers, they cannot take the, uh, the first constraints they cannot generate it. You need a person that is saying, like, OK, it, that, this is a constraint. You, I know that it's not going to happen. So what I learned when I was doing it was that uh, symbolic execution is a powerful tool. Uh, it helps me a lot when I am analyzing malware, because I don't need to find out which key he's, he's using for the shore or 
we, how, many ta how many times I need to go through this unpacking uh, uh, algorithm or whatever. Uh, and of course, the SMT servers can be used to simplify the control flow graph. That means I can just delete all the control flow graph, before, uh, the garbage code, before I even start analyzing anything. So I'm not, I, I'm not starting any binary anymore without running it before. Um, what I did until now is like I, I wrote this binary garbage code eliminator. That means uh, I'm just cleaning everything before I start analyzing any kind of binary. Uh, I have the shore search, so it's a shore search everybody knows. Uh, there are plenty of them um, uh, out there, but uh, mine is pretty fast. And I also wrote some algorithms that can resolve an easy cryptographic algorithm like Cipher and stuff like that. And I'm trying to write more to help people with problems with ransomware. So what I'm working on right now is to I want to finish my generic unpacker. Um, I'm writing a C++ class hierarchy reconstructor, because in malware, we don't have this funny, nice table on the end of the binary. Uh, I'm also working on the Hadari 2 in, uh, integration, so that can be used together as a plugin, and a lot of other stuff that I am not, still not talking about, but I plan to do a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs>